And I'd like to invite uh, Stephen Cartwright. He's PhD in biochemistry, and he works in the Cherwell Innovation Center in Oxford. Well, um, good afternoon, and uh, thank you to the HRI for inviting me to speak. Um, the first thing I'll say is I'm going to be talking more about um, encapsulated dyes and membrane immobilized dyes, um, but they're kind of two sides of the same coin, really. Um, the most, in question, most important question I feel we can ask is what are homeopathic potencies at a, at a fundamental level? Because if, if we can answer that question, then the central piece of the jigsaw falls into place and all the other pieces will start to be answered. Um, but in order to ask that central question, we need to begin to start to ask very specific questions and get very specific answers, and um, in turn make specific testable predictions. I mean, basically that's, that's what hypothesis-driven science is all about, is making hypotheses, testing them, and then reformulating them. And I, I think that uh, the use of solvatochromic dyes is, um, is a model that's the way forward to ask those kind of specific questions. So I know some of you may not be familiar with um, experiments that have been done so far with solvatochromic dyes, but I, it's difficult to sort of run right through from the very beginning, but I'll just summarize that um, it's now we can see that a lot of solvatochromic dyes interact with homeopathic potencies. We've probably tested up to about 60 altogether, and they all respond to different degrees. And it's been possible to, to um, elucidate three basic steps in the uh, interaction. There's a primary um, dye potency interaction that's electronic in nature, and that results in an electron density shift, and that's really crucial. Um, and it only happens with solvatochromic dyes. Uh, and the secondary step is as a result of the first step, which is that the dye then, um, those are pKa changes, so dissociation constant changes for those of you who are chemists and those of you who aren't, uh, don't worry. Uh, and then the, f the final step is um, that that then changes dye aggregation equilibria. And that third step tends to amplify the initial effect of potency. But really, um, the time has come, as it were, to look at that primary step that, that primary initial interaction, because if we can isolate that, then we can start to ask some very specific questions about what potencies are and how they're having their effect. So just to briefly say, um, there are three sort of scenarios, really. There's free dye, um, which you can look at in solution, and that's what we've been doing up until now. Uh, there's encapsulated dye, and that's what I'm going to be talking about mainly. And then there's membrane immobilized dyes. And they allow you to ask very specific sets of questions because when you encapsulate, you exclude the solvent. Um, Water-insoluble dyes can be used. You protect the dye from any degradation because uh, some of these dyes are sensitive. Most of them aren't, but a few are sensitive. And there's some special sensitive dyes that are worth looking at. Um, and using immobilized dyes, you can't exclude solvent, but what you can do is separate the dye phase from the solvent phase. So you've got a, a solid dye phase and a liquid solvent phase. So you can do sort of clever things with the amount of potency you add and so on, and use ascending potencies with the dye still in place and it, it's not being diluted. Um, with free dye, unless you've got non-aggregating dye, you, you can't inhibit aggregation, but you can with encapsulated dye and uh, immobilized dyes. So, just to briefly um, just go through that all solvatochromic dyes share in common an electron donor group at one end, an electron bridge, and an electron acceptor group at the other end. And here are some examples. Um, the top four are used in the present study that I'll talk about, and the bottom four are also used in the present study. The top four are negatively solvatochromic, and I'll come to what that means in a minute, and the bottom four are positively solvatochromic you'll notice that their structures are all very different. And that was a specific uh, reason for doing that, because uh, we wanted to see um, what effects potency had on that first initial interaction, um, regardless of what structure was. So the only common feature to all these dyes is there's an electron donor, electron acceptor, and a bridge in between. So, and it's because of that special, the, the electron donor, acceptor, and bridge in between, 
that sulbatochromic dyes are very sensitive. And that they're only sensitive to two things, and that is the polarity of the solvent they're in and to any electric fields that might be present. And that's really crucial to, to remember those, those two things, that only the solvent polarity and an electric field will affect these dyes. Um, positively solvatochromic dyes absorb at longer wavelengths so the solvent becomes more polar or there's an applied electric field. And that's because their excited charge state is stabilised. So if you can imagine, if you've got something that's charged, it's going to be stabilised if it's an environment that's more polar or, or, or the environment itself is, is charged. And conversely, negatively solvatochromic dyes absorb at shorter wavelengths as the solvent becomes more polar or there's an applied electric field because again, in this case, their ground state is stabilized. So the crucial thing is, is what, what is charged is what becomes stabilized. So just in diagrammatic form, um, you can see that with positively solvatochromic dyes, um, the excited state stabilized, so you need less energy to make the electron jump from the ground state to the excited state. And so the light that's absorbed is sort of red shifted, it's to a longer wavelength, more towards the infrared as it were. Whereas with negatively solvatochromic dyes, it's the ground state that's stabilized with, uh, with a more polar solvent or an electric field. And so you need more energy to make the electron jump. And so the, the spectrum is going to be blue shifted. So it's very simple, really. Um, it, you just have to kind of get to grips with it. But actually, it's very straightforward. So these two classes of dye give complementary information about their environment. So we know that potencies affect the spectra of solvatochromic dyes. Um, I, I won't dwell on the, uh, the, the publications, but they're all there. Um, but the real question, looking at that first initial step, is are potencies making water more polar, generating a solvatochromic effect, or are they producing an electric field, generating an electrochromic effect? And as I say, solvatochromic dyes are called solvatochromic, but actually they respond to two things solvent polarity and an electric field. So they're both electrochromic and solvatochromic. So this is a really interesting question to ask. And if we get the, the conditions right, we, we'll get a really interesting answer. So the way to find out, the way to ans ask this question is to use cyclodextrins. And these are soluble encapsulators. I mean, basically what they do is they, the, the, the dye goes into the middle of this encapsulator and it sits there and in a hydrophobic environment, so there's no water. It, it's sort of protected from the solvent, which makes it a very interesting uh, uh, um, uh, system to look at. And um, so dyes of widely varying structure can be looked at uh, and will have been looked at, with the only common feature being a donor, acceptor, uh, an electron bridge in between. Um, some of these dyes, those of you who know about solvatochromic work will have seen before. Uh, some of them you won't. Uh, this one's a particularly interesting dye because it, it has a carbon ion donor, which is really unusual. Um, and then uh, the, the pyridinium, or not pyridinium, but the quaternary nitrogen acceptor. Um, some of the others you will have seen before. Uh, these are positively solvatochromic. This one's interesting um, because it opens up when uh, at uh, 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 certain pH values and it allows you to immobilize it on, uh, on membranes and I'll come to that if there's time. So all these eight dyes have been looked at um, and I'll show you some results now. Um, just bearing in mind the color wheel that uh, the color of a dye is opposite to the, the light frequency that it absorbs. So a red dye opposite is absorbing blue light and a blue dye is absorbing sort of red light. Um, it'll just make sense of some of these results. So these are results with positively solvatochromic dyes. Um, the first one is methylene violet, um, which absorbs around 615 nanometers. When you add arsenic and 10M, which is the potency we've been using, uh, and there are reasons for using that, mainly I think we need to use high potencies, uh, definitely above 12C, so you don't get any mixed material homeopathic effect. And my feeling is, if we're going to show uh, what homeopathy is all about, then high potencies are, are where it's at, really. Um, and what you get is, is a red shift. So what this is, it's showing you the absorbance of the dye, and then what happens when you add arsenicum. Uh, so the second, this, this sort of jagged spectrum is a different spectrum between control and, uh, and arsenicum um, with dye. 
And so you can see it's redshifted um, by, uh, you know, it looks quite a lot. It's about 0.5 nanometers, actually, that, that, that the shift is. Um, so that's the first positively solvatic chromic dye. The next one is BDF, which was the subject of, um, of a paper a couple of years ago. And again, you can see that in the presence of arsenic and 10M, there's, there's a, a red shift um, in the spectrum. Uh, again, it's about 0.4 nanometers. Thirdly, phenol blue is another positively solvatic chromic dye. And again, you get uh, a shift of um, about 0.4 nanometers. Uh, and finally, the last positively solvatic chromic dye is a dimethyl uh, uh, amino um, benzylidine rhodamine, which uh, again you get a, a red shift of 0.25 nanometers. So four positively solvatic chromic dyes all shift in the same direction in the presence of arsenicum. Uh, you don't see that shift with controls. So uh, red shift with, uh, with um, positively solvatic chromic dyes with arsenicum. So the four negatively solvatic chromic dyes um, the first dye is, is demi, you see the opposite effect. So the shift in absorbance is, is, is a blue shift. In other words, the ground state's being stabilized rather than the excited state with, um, with, with uh, the positively solvatic chromic dyes. Um, next one, 4PP, which is going into the ultraviolet. It, it just absorbs um, in uh, around 368 nanometers. Uh, and again, there's a blue shift. Uh, Brooker's merocyanin, uh, again negatively solvatic chromic, uh, blue shift. And finally, ET1, um, blue shift. So we have four negatively solvatic chromic dyes all showing a blue shift, four positively solvatic chromic dyes all showing a red shift. So regardless of structure and type of solvatic chromism, the dyes are responding according to the same underlying mechanism. And there's only two possibilities. One, there's an increased solvent-mediated effect, which is solvatic chromism, or the presence of an electric field or operating to produce the effect seen. But because we're using a cyclodextrin, they exclude water from their hydrophobic cores on binding. So dyes are effectively, the solvation is, is prevented, um, and contact's necessary for a solvatic chromic effect, and consequently solvatic chromism cannot occur in encapsulated dyes. It's known, however, that embedding dyes in cell membranes, etc., you do get electrochromic response. So it's known that these dyes do respond to an electric field. So that's a good, strong evidence that what we're looking at is the presence of an electric field. And um, backup evidence is from a previous study um, in which it was shown that uh, the the length of the ground, uh, the, the dipole moment of the dye, and its molecular rigidity affect how much it's affected by potencies. And those things are features that don't correlate with solvatic chromic response, but do correlate with electrochromic response. And finally, um, bridged amino acids aren't solvatic chromic at all, and yet they still respond to homeopathic potencies. So there's three good pieces of evidence that what we're looking at is not a solvent-induced effect, but an electric field-induced effect that's coming from the arsenicum. So the next big question is, is it possible to assign an approximate strength to this field? Um, and yes, it is, um, because there's one dye, Brooker's merocyanin, for which there's both solvatic chromic and electric data, electrochromic data available, which means it's possible to equate shifts in this dye spectra with a magnitude of an unknown electric field, in this case, arsenicum 10M. And the figure you get is 1.2 times 10 to the 7 volts per meter, which is extraordinary because the potential difference across cell membranes is almost exactly the same. It's 7 to 8 times 10 to the 6 volts per meter. So just going back, so you're talking at 12 times 10 to the 6 and 7 to 8 times 10 to the 6. Now, this figure, it, it could be twice as much, it could be half as much. Uh, I mean, a lot more calculations need to be done, a lot more experiments need, need to be done, but it's that ballpark figure, which means that, um, okay, I, I, in contrast, electric field strength in, the, in enzymes are, are much higher, um, but across membranes, they're of that, that magnitude. So it's quite possible arsenicum 10M has an electric field that's certainly of a magnitude that could result in physiological and biochemical changes, at least with regard to cell membrane potential differences and possibly other processes, even if not directly on enzyme catalysis. Um, but, you know, biological processes uh, have a whole range of different uh, uh, um, electrostatic figures involved. 
So, just this is a logical argument, really. The hypothesis that potencies possess an electric field component also explains previous, oh no, sorry, this is just previous results which back up and make sense of, um, th this is from the first paper on solvatic chromic dyes, which I never really understood, but now I do because those results make sense in the light of it, they being in the presence of an electric field. Um, but I don't have time to go into that. So the next question is, if there's an electric field, there have to be separated charges. But how is that possible? It must mean that potencies are in a metastable state where charges are prevented from recombining or they're recombining and separating all the time. Um, but let's, for the sake of argument, say it's a metastable state. If that's the case, which logically it must be, then you can make a prediction that potencies should emit photons under conditions that promote charge recombination, like heat, light, and high voltages. And this hypothesis should, in principle, be testable using a modified form of forced resonance energy transfer, where you, you irradiate uh, the potency at a wavelength that's away from a fluorophore. The potencies emit light, and then the fluorophore picks up that light and then emits its own light. So we can make a predict prediction that's a specific prediction and is testable, and that's going to be the next step, really. Um, so just to finish, uh, this is kind of going off in all sorts of different directions, really. Uh, solvatic chromic dyes, you look at membranes, uh, which I, I haven't got time to show you, encapsulators. Um, if we annihilate the dyes, so they make them longer and more rigid, they're going to respond much more strongly, because that's known from electrochromic dyes used in physiology. Um, and um, positive and negative dye complementarity is really interesting. Uh, FRET is, is, a, is a technique which can use directly on potencies because the solvatic chromic dyes are now feeding information about potencies directly. It's possible because we know they've got an electric field, we can start looking at amplification and degradation of potencies. And then there's another area of how potencies interact with people, which um, you, you can, I can't go into because I don't have time. Um, but there's a whole load of different experiments now that can be done. Um, membrane immobilized eyes, I can't talk about, but there's a couple of pictures of them. Uh, and I'll just leave you with a, with a quote by Niels Bohr, which I just think is a great quote. If we all agree that your theory is crazy, the question is whether it's crazy enough to be true. Um, and it was in response to Max Planck, apparently. Uh, and th thank you for funding from the Standard Homeopathic Company for this research. <laughs>